Hello everybody, welcome to my channel ADC English Literature. I am Ardhendu De. Today we are going to discuss kids on first looking into Chapman's Homer, one of the most beautiful sonnets by kids that leads us to his mind, earning the very adoration and respect for classical literature, particularly Homer, and that of his tribute to that Elizabethan translator Chapman. But before we begin, a few words on Keats' poetry. Keats is one of the major poets of the Romantic Revival of the early 19th century. Along with Byron and Shelley, he forms the trio of the younger Romantic poets. Keats was greatly fascinated by classical literature comprising the poetry of Homer and Virgil. I think you all have gone through a beautiful few of the odes written by kids that are all Hellenism. His emotional reacting to Homer's poetry is that classicism is conveyed in this sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. However, uh, despite his love for Greek lore and his interest in classical literature, Keats is thoroughly a romantic poet, you know. The idealistic view is superimposed. Keats developed his own romantic theory of poetry and expressed it in his poem Sleep and Poetry. Just as Wordsworth and Coleridge had formulated their romantic theory of poetry in the preface to lyrical ballads about 20 years ago. So is his sleep and poetry that tells the mechanism of his writing of the poetry, romantic poetry. No poet could have owned his education more completely to the English poets than did John Keats. His knowledge of Latin was slight. He knew no Greek. Even the classical stories, which he loved and constantly used, came to him almost entirely through the medium of Elizabethan translations and some from the other sources. In this connection, it is interesting to read his first fine sonnet in which he celebrates his introduction to the greatest literary faculty of Greek poets in the form of translations by a great English artist Chapman, George Chapman. Its noble sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer, uh, it shows uh, the impression made by the very translation on one poet is so possessed in this finest poetic susceptibilities that Keats is lost in the vast domain of artistry. Now before we proceed further, a few words to be added from George Chapman. He is a translator of Homer's Iliad and was a contemporary of Shakespeare's. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, Keats compares reading translations of poetry to awe-inspiring experiences such as an astronomer discovering a new planet or explores first seeing the Pacific Ocean. Keats uh, read the works of Homer in the translation forms. It was made by Elizabethan poet George Chapman. He did this in the company of his bosom friend Charles Cowden Clark, uh, the son of his former master and his lifelong friend. That Keats had a monumental experience is clear from reading this particular sonnet. And that moment is moment of awe, inspiration, veneration, and obviously a vivid journey through literature. Somewhat like a true Petrarchan sonnet, uh, Petrarchan rhyme schemes, generally the rhythm of iambic pentameter you all know, 
it forms a b b a a b b a in the octave part and the sestet part c d c d c d this poem also is divided in that treatment theme uh, between the octave and the sestet in the octave part kit sets the background uh, or the subject while the sestet describes the effect on him of this particular experiences that he has told in his octave part now let's start reading this poem much have i traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen round many western islands have i been which birds in filthy to apple hold in the very first half of this octave part uh, kit speaks of his wide study of western literature which he characterizes as realms of gold so the realms of gold or the treasury of gold is the western literary hubs uh, kit's metaphor is here given uh, an insight into his attitude towards literature it's like that of mining gold mining the goodly states and the kingdoms the two words uh, that poet uh, makes the meaningful territories that have been marked out by their own in the infinite area of the english or western languages so these particular two words have the meaning of treasure house of languages particularly western much have i traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen have at this territories are held by poet not insolently you know as kingdoms are held in the historical stories but as a sign of their loyalty towards apollo the ancient classical god of poetry so uh, kit says round many western islands have i been which birds in filthy to apollo hold so in love of his greek god apollo uh, he makes a, a value he makes a valuable lines where he pays his tribute to that literary form so it's a pure sign of kids uh, literary pity or we all know that kids like sally was not a christian poet so uh, he has no burden of not praising anything which is truly appealing him so he praises the greek treasure house of poetry or the greek muse the second half of the octave extends the metaphor of the kingdom of poetry to tell us that kids has heard uh, about homer's epics although he had never read them up to one wide expanse had i been told that dip proud homer ruled as his demon ye did i never breathe its pure serene till i heard chapman speak out loud and bold homer is traditionally recognized as the first epic poet of europe just like valmiki and basdeva as in our india they can be considered pure and original because they did not borrow their images from other poets they are telling the tales of our life homer knew and understood every part and parcel of human nature and he does so dispassionately never makes him truly attached if he makes attachment he will not be able to deliver the exact points so his understanding was clear and unclouded by doubts distractions and fears besides homer was the monarch of poets deserving the exalted title of serene it is at the end of the octave that kits tells us kits tells us 
about the cause of his translocation or his reading poetry with Charles. That of Homer he is reading it is Chapman's translocation. But one thing is notably here that octave and sustained does not make a break by full stop but it is semicolon. Up top one wide expense I had been told that deep brown Homer ruled as his demon. Yet did I never breathe in pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. So all the appeal of that Homer or the great son of literature Homer with whom Keats has a, had a chance of meeting is being possible by Chapman's translation. Now in the sister part, having told us about the background of his poem in the octave, Keats turns to communicate his enjoyment of Homer, particularly how he enjoyed Homeric poetry in, in the sister. This is done through two un unforgettable images. The first of these is that of a professional astronomer uh, who is busy side being a new planet. Then felt I some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his skin. The second is that of a discoverer such as Herman Cortage. Uh, who conquered Mexico for Spain, as per Keats is saying, and became the first Western adventurer to enter Mexico City. Historically, this is not the fact. Uh, originally, it was Balbao who was the first European in 1513 to stand up on the peak of Darien in the Darien province of Panama. Um, so that historical fact is to be corrected. Or like stout cottage when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in time. And this is very significant. Uh, that Keats does not name any astronomer in the first part uh, as such of Galileo had discovered new satellites of the planet at that time uh, it was Jupiter. It would be in keeping with Keats' pity to infer that in referring to some watcher of the skies he is making the use of very poetic device that is known as very precious. You know, uh, if the image help Keats uh, in communicating his peculiar feelings or favor uh, of the saints or meaning, the rhythm of uh, the parts, uh, it gives a further it gives further density by suggesting the right tone and unfolding the intention while rephrasing his meaning or sense and feeling. So the very word which has been told in round amount way. It itself emphasizing the very point that discovering Homer Chapman is like that of discovering new planet as it is done by Galileo or enjoying a new discovered land in front of him the Pacific island land in which uh, that discoverer found itself so amazed similarly he was at the peak of poetic creation when he finds Homer's works through Chapman's translation and he found that kind of joy as Galileo or any other astronomer have found or any other traveler have found that joy through a discovery of a new land. And it is told, looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in time. So that silence is the placidity, that silence is the creative art 
that silence is the ultimate joy in a poet in front of this. As you all know, Keats has been called a poet of the senses. The abstract idea of the discovery of a planet gives joy. That is to be celebrated. But the sight of the seascape from the peak is more sensual and akin to Keats' character, you know. The choice of Keats' imagery in this sonnet and marrying it to the appropriate rhythm clinches the success of this poem. The, the poem becomes an instant hit on first looking into champ and somar become a felicitas record of kids unforgettable personal experience of an encounter with the father of european poetry and that was homer in fact the max muller has introduced Kalidasa into the western world many of the kids were surprised to see that plethora of creation the god of creation. So such kind of surprise kids had when he met Homer through Chapman. So I think you have got the points that I am studying and into your understanding, into your reading of this poem, if you find any difficulty or like to share any point of view of yours, just ask me, I will try my best to help you or I can be benefited out of your suggestions. Like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel. Bye-bye.